Good morning, everyone. My name is Dana White. We're here today for the eighth in our series of talks of Lionel Corbett. Today, we have a new myth of God. We're here with Dr. Gard Jameson and Dr. Will Lynn. And so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Lionel Corbett. Lionel, good morning. Good morning, Dana. Thank you. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today is what I think is an emerging new God image based on Jung's psychology. Um, and I think I'm going to suggest that this new God image, uh, which is psychologically based, avoids some of the problems associated with traditional image of, images of God in, in the Judeo-Christian tradition. So what I'd like to talk about uh, is show first of all some of the problems associated with the traditional theistic God image and contrast that image with the way Jung thinks about the God image. Um, I am going to suggest that Jung's approach to the God image allows the development of a very personal connection to the sacred that may have nothing to do with traditional accounts of sacred experience. The basic difference that I'm going to try and show is that Jung's approach is empirical and phenomenological based on direct experience by means of the psyche, whereas the classical theistic God image is based on revelation, on scripture, and on doctrinal and dogmatic elaboration of scriptural accounts. But, for, but in Jung's approach, the range of God images that spontaneously appear within the psyche is much broader than the God image of traditional theistic religions. I think this is important because many of the classical ways of talking about God arose as part of an ancient worldview, a type of consciousness that is really radically different than our own. And the old views are unhelpful because they're out of touch with the way the sacred actually is experienced today. The religious traditions of the past use language and ways of thinking that no longer speak to us. So they lack, for lots of people, they lack contemporary meaning. Increasing numbers of people no longer feel attached to any of the existing theistic traditions. I think the era of dogmatic religion is slowly fading. It has been ever since the Enlightenment. Um, the, the kind of anthropomorphic God images that they use, like God as a supernatural shepherd or a lord or a king, just seem very remote to us. Now, Jung thought that religion is inevitable and the notion of God is ubiquitous because the psyche contains an archetypal potential to experience a God image. Jung refers to this God image in the psyche as the self which in the English language literature is written with a capital S. This is a potential to experience a God, which, which he, calls, he calls it the God within us. And what happens is it's given a content by local religious teachings. So whatever uh, uh, country or culture or religious background you happen to be born in, you project the self onto that local name for God. So in a Christian culture, you'd call that Christ. If you happen to be in India, you'd call it Shiva or Krishna or some other name. Um, but basically, um, there's always a local name for God, and the, the, and the self is projected onto that local name. I like the analogy of language. All children have the ability to learn a language, but we learn the local language. But what what is true is that the manifestations of the self within the psyche can be entirely different than the traditional theistic descriptions of God that are found in the Bible or in the liturgy or in doctrine and dogma. Jung thinks that the self appears in the form of numinous experiences of wholeness. I talked about that in, in, in our first talk, so I'm not going to repeat it uh, again. Um, but Basically, his idea is that the unconscious produces numinous experiences of wholeness. And these experiences of the self may have little resemblance to traditional image, images of, the, of, of God. So I'm going to give you an example of a dream image of the self. The dream is this. It's a dream of a woman. I was surrounded by a fine mist. 
I sensed a presence as if someone was coming toward me. The mist opened to reveal a gigantic blue eye about three feet across. I felt penetrated by its gaze and I stood there in awe and fascination. The contours of the eye became red, orange and gold. The eye came closer until I was only aware of the iris, which became square, then round, then square again, continuing to change back and forth from square to round. The eye then seemed like, uh, like a huge window or door, beyond which I could see a world of light and into which I could now enter. I was excited by this landscape, but also frightened by the sense of infinity and eternity that I saw. The light beyond the door was unlike any light I have ever seen. It was silvery and cold, but also warm and soft and colorless. I felt as though I was falling into it. Now, Jung would say this is a self symbol, a, a, a symbol of the intrapsychic divine. It's obviously not Judeo-Christian, Judeo but the dreamer felt as if she'd been seen by a kind of divine eye that acted as a portal or window into a transpersonal or spiritual realm. The whole dream image for Jung would be what Jung refers to as a mandala image. The mandala is one of the classical self symbols. It represents an enclosure of sacred space and a spiritual center. Jung thought that circles and spheres are ancient symbols of infinity or completion or heaven or the divine because they're perfect shapes with no beginning and no end. Whereas uh, you remember that the iris changes from a circle to a square, uh, symbols of fourness like squares and cubes are traditionally incarnate or earthly symbols of stability and wholeness because they refer to the earth's four directions four seasons, four elements, and so on. Um, so the, the circle is endless and infinite. The square has order and limitation and form. So the, the dream motif of squaring the circle implies this mutual reciprocity of heaven and earth or the union of heaven and earth in some kind of higher synthesis. Again, not a particularly Judeo-Christian but image, but very numinous. Now, the dream was emotionally very powerful, and it inspired a kind of awe and wonder in the dreamer, which, uh, and these feelings are characteristic of numinous experiences of the sacred or the holy. This is obviously not a, a specifically Judeo-Christian God image, but it's clearly a numinous symbol of the self. We can't tell whether these kind of experiences are generated by the unconscious or whether the psyche acts as a kind of medium of transmission of a divinity beyond the psyche. In other words, we don't know if what we call the unconscious is identical with the divine, but according to Jung, the unconscious is the medium, this is a quote, the medium from which religious experience seems to flow. For practical purposes, that question doesn't matter. But the fact that the psyche spontaneously produces this kind of numinous imagery explains why human beings have always had a sense of the divine. Here's another example of a self-symbol. Again, radically different than Judeo-Christian God images. This is a, an example from a, dr a dream that Jung reported in a letter. He sees a bluish diamond-like star in heaven, very beautiful, and it was reflected in a round, quiet pool on earth, heaven above, heaven below. So the heavenly diamond is also a self-symbol. Self it's a perfect mandala. It's an imago dei, an image of the divine because of its perfect mandala shape and its precious nature. And here in the dream, it's reflected in the small pool, which represents the individual psyche. So that's a good example of the old as above, so below maxim. But it, I, I'm just giving you these examples to illustrate the fact that these are numinous experiences that are radically different than Judeo-Christian ways of talking about uh, the divine. Of course, the Bible is full of these kind of experiences. The prophet Ezekiel had, had a vision of the self, a cloud of light with, with uh, angelic forms in it, with wheels. 
uh, and so on. Um, and uh, this was an extremely uh, numinous image for Ezekiel that he thought was an image of the glory of the Lord. And, and um, th this vision was often seen in the tradition as the descent of God in a chariot surrounded by angels. And it became a source of inspiration in the Jewish mystical tradition. Now, if, if uh, but the, the point I'm trying to make is that people uh, at all uh, periods of history, and including today, still experience this kind of numinous imagery, and it may not take this kind of Judeo-Christian form. Now, of course, it's very possible to uh, reduce this kind of experience. So in the case of Ezekiel, a lot of people have said that he must have, had a, he must have been epileptic or he was psychotic. And some people have suggested that because of all the wheels and the noise that his, his, he had a vision of, his vision was actually a UFO. These are kind of reductive uh, accounts of, of ways of dismissing these kind of experiences. For Jung, what's important is the numinous quality of the experience, and Jung describes empirically a very wide range of dream imagery. Now, this is not surprising. The, the, the range is wide because the self, according to Jung, the capital S self, is the totality of the psyche. And because it's a totality symbol, there's no end to the way it can manifest itself. So I'll give you some of the ways it can manifest itself. What's characteristic of all of them is that they're very numinous. It can, the self can appear as a savior figure, which is what, uh, like Christ or, some, or the Buddha or something like that, but that Jung would regard as what he calls a superordinate personality. I should uh, mention here, parenthetically, talking about reduction, that when the psychoanalysts hear this kind of dream <clears throat> of a figure like that, they, uh, they will um, see it in terms of projected infantile omnipotence, or they'll see it in terms of an idealized transference. So it's always possible to reduce and dismiss this kind of experience as not an experience of the sacred or the holy. The self can appear as a divine child, a, a child who's radiant or special in some way, um, another way it can appear is uh, as a, a figure that um, uh, unites opposites, a figure that's both male and female, or both young and old. Or, uh, uh, um, um, recently I saw the image of a winged snake, a snake with wings. So this is the idea that Jung writes about as the, uh, as the self as a complex of opposites. The self is, a, because it's a totality symbol, it unites opposites. So the snake, of course, is an earth animal, and the fact that it has wings in this image means that the opposites of heaven and earth are united. This is very characteristic of self symbols that hold the complex of opposites together, or it reconciles the opposites. Um, the, the self can also appear in dreams as an awe-inspiring natural phenomenon, um, gigantic mountains often with a glow about them in the dream. <clears throat> Another common symbol of the self is a gigantic tree. Trees, of course, will manifest the life principle and its cycles of growth and decay and then degeneration. Or the... Um, uh, the self may appear as a powerful storm or wind that co conveys the ancient notion of the spirit of God as an impersonal presence. Animal symbol symbolism is also possible. Um, very often the, the animal appears as a kind of golden outsized creature that seems to be expressing the instinctual level of the self. The self can also appear in a dream as a voice. Um, or as a, as a waking experience of what people have called the inner light or an inner voice that seems to know more than the conscious personality. We we're reminded here of the still small voice that appeared to the prophet Elijah. I think the, the city of Jerusalem carries the numinosity of the self for many people. It acts as a kind of axis mundi, the, an axis of the world or a, a spiritual center for various religious traditions. Um, so 
Uh, I mentioned the mandala symbolism, which is very important. Mandalas are geometrical figures that express wholeness or totality. Think of the Taoist yin yang symbol. Mandalas are always some combinations of circles, squares, crosses, stars, uh, and they express the self in, in an abstract form. I'll, I'll show you one later on, that, uh, an actual dream image. Um, and often there's a kind of central point to the mandala that seems to hold it all together. And Jung thought this was a particularly important kind of self symbol. So, for example, a UFO in a dream, because the UFO is mandala-shaped, that's a, 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 another kind of self-symbol. It's obviously not a Judeo-Christian self-symbol, but not uncommon. The, the mandala shape represents wholeness and harmony and completion. And you remember that Jung discovered after the break with Freud that painting these figures produced a kind of calming and centering effect. He first had this kind of uh, dream image in 1927 when he had what he called his Liverpool dream, in which he, he seemed to be at the center of the city and where he saw a square with an island on it in which there was a gorgeous magnolia tree with reddish blossoms. And the, the city was divided into quarters that were arranged radially around a central point forming a perfect mandala. And the island was blazing with sunlight and it seemed important that in the dream, the city was dirty and sooty and it was winter and raining, but there was this tremendous light at the center. So this is the kind of mandala that expresses a psychological situation. I think the gloom of the city probably reflected Jung's life situation at the time, but he's given an image of a glowing light numinous center that sustained him, that gave him information that there is light at the center. And he said this dream felt like an act of grace. He says that in, in memories. So he thought that the mandala is a, is a primary expression of the self. Um, so we see mandala nowadays in the form of symmetrical gardens, symmetrical temples, flowers like lotuses or roses, things like that. And um, these dream images appear uh, in dreams when the individual is going through a period of disorientation or confusion. It's an attempt to restore a, a sense of order, part of the self-regulating function of the psyche. Th these dreams are part of a self-healing process. Now, there are, I've mentioned a wide range of self-images, and it's obvious that none of them can be the self itself. They're all pointing to some underlying essence that cannot itself be imagined. Now, many uh, God images are anthropomorphic, uh, and this is why the, the uh, philosopher Feuerbach said that our God image is only the projection of human values. Our God images only tell us about ourselves, according to Feuerbach. What we, what we like in ourselves, we project onto God in an exaggerated form. Um, and the, what Feuerbach was complaining about is that the theistic God image often imagines the divine as if it was a superhuman personality, uh, but infinite rather than finite, immortal rather than mortal, omnipotent rather than fragile, and, and so on. In, or, in other words, according to the critique, we've created a God image that reflects some of the characteristics of humanity, but without human limitations. So the, Feuerbach's point is that whatever people were asserting about God was an assertion about some aspect of human psychology writ large. The point I'm trying to make is that I think that's a very trenchant, powerful critique, but Jung's approach in terms of all these God images, these self images, completely avoids the anthropomorphisms associated with the traditional God image. So Feuerbach's critique would not really apply. There are other problems with the traditional God image that make me think we need a new one and that Jung's approach is useful. Um, I mentioned that they're all, they tend to be anthropomorphic. Um, God as a metaphorical shepherd or king. For many of us, these are not really meaningful metaphors. 
Um, and we can't take them too literally. Obviously, they're only metaphorical. But there are other problems and paradoxes, um, just a few of them. God classically is described as omnipotent, omniscient, ubiquitous, all good, eternal, a supreme spirit, and so on. God is described as personal and at the same time transcendent. God is described as omnipotent and entirely loving, in spite of the fact that there is widespread suffering and evil. So theists have to rationalize the suffering and evil that we witness. They, they talk about it as uh, in terms of the mystery of the God has his own reasons and so on. For Jung, um, suffering and evil are simply part of the dark side of the self. Um, God is sent, said to be totally perfect, but nobody's quite sure what perfection means when applied to God. God is said to be changeless, but there are paradoxes here because in the Hebrew Bible, for example, he, he seems to change very frequently. Abraham pleads with God to spare some of the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah. Um, God is said to be moved by prayer, to compassionately respond out of love. He's said to be entirely self-sufficient, but he also manifests himself in revelations. And he's said to relate to human beings and intervene in history, which to me suggests that he's not entirely self-sufficient. Why, why would you need to manifest in history if you were self-sufficient? God is said to be outside of time and space and natural law and cannot be detected by the, any of the instruments of natural science, but somehow manages to interact with the physical world. If God, if God is pure spirit, it's not clear how he interacts with matter. There are these kinds of contradictions in the classical God image that theologians have had to struggle to deal with. For example, they've said that God has uh, qualified aspects and also an absolute infinite aspect. But in spite of the fact that God has both these aspects, God is said to be a unitary being. You see how Jung is avoiding all these kind of philosophical problems by just talking about empirical, phenomenologically observable uh, intrapsychic experiences. Christianity makes the problem very complicated with the doctrine of the incarnation, leading to a God who is both fully human and fully divine. They've never been able to explain how God could incarnate while also remain changeless and infinite. So the theologians have had to deal with some serious difficulties conceptually. They can fall back on the incomprehensibility of God by saying that God is beyond our cognitive capacity. They can fall back on the need for faith. Jung's approach doesn't depend on faith. It doesn't have these kind of inconsistencies because it's purely based in direct experience. Of course, faith becomes, still remains very important, but faith can be based on personal numinous experience, which can then be accompanied by critical inquiry. Or, or one simply might have faith in the sense of commitment to the idea that the universe has an, a background intelligent order without giving it any specific content or name, only focusing on the way we experience it, for example, in the form of the self. So that in terms of Jung's approach, there's no need to believe that the mythic biblical stories are literal history and no need for anthropomorphic God images. So the, um, the only point of agreement between dip different types uh, uh, of theism is that the nature of God is not fully knowable by human beings. All we can rely on is what is given in Revelation and what is said by inspired people, by, such as the prophets. So theists will commonly use words like ineffable or inexpressible. The, the problem is that if God is entirely inexpressible, then the concept of God has no content, no content at all. And if God, if the content of God, if the concept of God has no content at all, it's difficult to say in what sense God exists. We can't reasonably say that we know the unknowable. So that's why most theists will attribute some characteristics to their God image. They say that God is almighty, 
and holy and eternal and, and, and powerful and so on. But at the same time, they maintain that the essence of God is beyond our understanding. So this leads to a tremendous paradox. They say that God is infinite, but God also has some qualities. And if you say that God has qualities, then can, God cannot be infinite because God wouldn't have the opposite qualities. So God would have to be limited. So because of these kind of logical paradoxes, there is a tendency for Theus to retreat into notions of the incomprehensibility of God. Or Paul Tillich says, the question of the existence of God can be neither asked nor answered because the notion of existence implies a finite nature. So that to say that God exists implies that God is finite. There are all kinds of complex philosophical problems in here. And I, I'm trying to show that if you just look at the symbolic manifestations of the self that Jung describes, all of these complex problems are avoided. The theists say that God is good. Um, we don't know what good means in this context. Uh, could you go into a children's cancer ward and say that God is good? Um, there are, of course, the process theologians who say that God is only absolute in some respects and still is in the process of evolving. And that idea can be compared to Jung's notion that our God image is gradually transforming as we penetrate more and more into the unconscious. But this transformation may only apply to the human God image, the God image that we experience, and not to the divine itself. We aren't sure about that. We don't know if the divine itself is changing or not. Um, so that there are all these problems with the commonly used attributes of God that lead to philosophical conundrum. God created the world and God is supposed to be all good, but the world is obviously not all good. And is God then complicit in the fact that the world is full of evil? Is there some relationship between the creator and what God uh, and, and the creation itself? How can you know a God who's transcendent? Is it anything like interpersonal knowing? Uh, is the way we know God in some analogous way similar to the way we know other human beings? Can we only know God as an idea from scripture, from revelation? In Jung, the, this question is answered because the self is imminent in the psyche. What seems to be transcendent is actually the experience of the non-ego levels of the psyche. Each manifestation of the self for Jung is a revelation. The theistic traditions believe that revelation has stopped. Uh, if in the Christian tradition, they would say it ended with, the, with when the New Testament was finally written. For Jung, every time you have a new experience of the self or the, new, the numinous level of the psyche, that's a new revelation. So Jung is avoiding philosophical questions like this. Um, another difficulty is, uh, for example, the idea of God's omnipotence. Um, the, the classic uh, challenge to this question is uh, to ask, can God create a weight that he cannot lift? Obviously, if there is such a thing as God's, as God's omnipotence, you have to restrict it to what's conceivable. Uh, can you really reconcile God's total goodness with God's behavior in the Hebrew scriptures? We know that several places, in, uh, say in Amos, in Lamentations, in Isaiah, uh, God is, is said to be responsible for evil. We know about the atrocities demanded by God during the occupation of Canaan, where God tells the Israelites to kill the occupants of conquered cities. He, sacri he sanctions uh, human sacrifices. He kills the firstborn of the Egyptians. He sanctions slavery. He commands the killing of witches. He orders death for violating the Sabbath. He orders death for homosexuality. This is divine brutality and vindictiveness that horrify the modern reader. And yet the theist maintains that God is entirely good. So what if you're a contemporary believer? You have to either ignore or rationalize these passages on the grounds of other principles in the Bible. Or you construct a morality based on the more enlightened sections of the text, 
or you construct a morality based on human standards, and then you retrospectively attribute those standards to your God. Um, and in spite of the punitive quality of the God image of the Hebrew scriptures, Christianity insists that its God is the same God, although the Christian God image is said to be one of love and mercy. This is another paradox. And although they say that uh, God is a God of love and mercy, they all, Christian teaching has also insisted that disbelievers will, tend, will spend eternity in hell in torment. Uh, here's a quote, he who does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God rests upon him, John 3, 36. There are all kinds of punishments for disbelief, and yet God is said to be good. You see the kind of paradoxes that are avoided by Jung's notion of the self. The fundamentalist preachers still insist on a God image that includes fire and brimstone, I know that's a notion that's embarrassing to liberal Christians. They like to ignore uncomfortable doctrines like hell and eternal damnations because um, these are difficult to defend today, but they were of great importance to traditional Christians. And of course, they're completely avoided by Jung's approach. Um, you can become abstract in your God image to avoid the anthropomorphisms um, instead of talking about God as a loving father, uh, you can make God more impersonal, but then you make God more difficult to relate to. So, for example, Tillich talked about God as the ground of being, but people complained, how do you have a personal relationship with an abstraction like the ground of being? It's, that almost sounds as if God is a kind of a substance rather than inconceivable spirit. On the other hand, if you go to the other extreme and you see God as, as a personal being or a supreme personality, then you turn God into a kind of entity and you fall into this uh, problem that, that um, Feuerbach noticed, that you, you just uh, you personify human virtues and human preferences and call them God. And if you use anthropomorphic metaphors like God as a divine king or father, you unconsciously stimulate a mental image of a very big person. And human ideas about God often fall into this kind of trap because of the use of this kind of metaphors, which are really idolatrous. So um, we can try these more sophisticated descriptions of the divine. We can say, for example, that um, the divine is being itself, it's not a being, or it's the ground of being, or it's unknowable absolute reality, or it's the moral order of the universe, or the creative principle of the universe, or as pure consciousness, or pure awareness, and so on. Um, but it's very difficult to have a relationship with an abstract idea, but it's not difficult to pay attention to the ego self axis. It's not difficult to pay attention to your dreams. It's not difficult for the ego to pay attention to the manifestations of the self and see the self as the transpersonal dimension of the psyche. This is what Jung was talking about when in the Red Book he, he said that a new consciousness of the divine is being born in the human soul, albeit against some resistance. Now, of course, resistance is inevitable. It's not easy to give up traditional God image. Uh, many people are attached to the traditional God image because we've been taught them since childhood. They were drummed into us as children. But God images inevitably change. And I think we are on the cusp of a new mythic image of God. Uh, Jung didn't get this idea of that the new God image is born in the soul from nowhere. I think he got it for, probably from uh, Meister Eckhart. Uh, but his idea was that a new consciousness of the divine is developing within the psyche. We have a new consciousness that's different than the people who wrote the Bible. New consciousness requires new God images. These images are mediated to us by the psyche. 
So God images are ubiquitous historically and geographically because they are an archetypal content of human psychology. The, and as I said at the beginning, the potential for the experience of the self is filled in by local religions. So I, I, I said at the beginning that for Christians, Christ is a symbolic representation of the self. But the point I want to get to is that for Jung, Christ is an incomplete symbol of the self. It's too exclusively light and too spiritualized and too masculine, of course. The notion that the, that, that the divine could be responsible for suffering and evil. Uh, and so what the Christian tradition, for example, has to do is project darkness onto the devil or the antichrist. And in that way, they, they retain the idea that God is only goodness and light. Um, the image of God as a trinity excludes the shadow. It also tends to exclude matter. It tends to exclude the feminine aspects of the self. And if you, if you exclude from your God image the feminine aspects of the self and matter, you are excluding the sacrality of a large segment of creation. This is why um, Jung thought that Trinitarian God images are incomplete, and he thought that a, a quaternity image would be a more complete symbol of wholeness. But he's not clear whether to, to, to make up the missing fourth, which we have to, whether we should add the shadow or the feminine aspects of the divine. He seems to veer between the two of them. But basically, you have to have a, sim, a self symbol or a God image that includes everything. It has to include the feminine aspects of the divine, and it has to include the dark side of the divine. You remember that Jung thought um, that among the alchemists, the, the Christ figure was compensated for with the figure called Mercurius. Mercurius represented the, the phonic spirit of the unconscious, the earth spirit, the material spirit, of the unconscious, the light of nature in matter, the spirit within matter. So for him, Christ and Mercurius are both symbols of the self. The Christ figure is a spiritualized version of the self, and the Mercurius figure is instinctual or bodily, and they're both important. You can't have one without the other. For the sake of wholeness, you have to have both these complementary dimensions of the self. You have to bring them together in our God image. Um, so this requires a dialogue between consciousness and the unconscious, between spirit and matter, recognizing that these are all aspects of a totality. Now, it's generally agreed that we can't prove or disprove the existence of God in, in the metaphysical sense. But the existence of numinous imagery of the kind that I described at the beginning is a psychological fact. It, this doesn't require any proof. There's no philosophical problem here because these, things, these experiences occur in dreams. They could occur at any time. This is, these are psychological facts. And for Jung, the psyche is ontologically real. There's no need for controversies about arguments about whether whether dream images really exist in the sense that you can argue about whether some transcendent god really exists jung made the point that it is only through the psyche this is a quote it's only through the psyche that we can establish that god acts on us although we're unable to distinguish whether these actions emanate from god or from the unconscious we cannot tell if God and the unconscious are two different entities. But what we can say is that in the unconscious, there's an archetypal image of wholeness that spontaneously manifests itself. And uh, Jung puts it in a letter this way. This is a quote. If God were to reveal himself to us, we have nothing except our psychic organs to register his revelation. And we couldn't express it except in the images of everyday speech. So when we experience one of these manifestations, for example, in a, a dream, a numinous dream, like the dream of the eye or the diamond in the sky reflected in a pool, we have been given a personal revelation. 
the main point again is that these images are not collective they're highly individual they're unique they're tailored to the individual every individual can have a personal god image that may have nothing to do with collective god images you no longer have to believe in a collective god image something in the bible uh, something that the theologians have told you about because you can have your own god images now i want to mention another manifestation uh, of the self which is how it appears in the form of synchronistic events uh, the, the experience of the self may appear in the form of a powerful synchronicity you'll remember that this was jung's term for the meaningful correspondence in time of a physical event and the subject's psychological state the important point is that there's no causal connection between what's going on in the mind of the subject and the outer physical event but they have the same meaning and Jung thought that these kind of synchronistic events are evidence for an underlying level of reality that's unitary he called it the unos mundos or one world this is the non-dual level of reality where the psyche and the physical world are inseparable inseparable aspects of a whole they are only separated within the perspective of the ego at this level there are no isolated entities there are no selves separate from the world so synchronistic events often have a sense of something meant to be they are purposeful in some way and they are a very important manifestation of the self when we experience an important synchronicity we realize we belong to a deeper level of reality than the ego can perceive so synchronicity links the inner world of the psyche with the outer world of physical events it links matter and spirit in other words we shouldn't think of the self as purely an intrapsychic phenomenon the self is responsible for important outer events in one's life as well as these kind of internal uh, dream events we, jung thought that we meet the unconscious as outer events in our life um, this is really a profound statement of the underlying unity of what seem to be separate inner and outer worlds but jung thought that when an inner situation is not made conscious we experience it in the outer world as fate maybe i'll just mention briefly parenthetically here what von franz said about this which may be relevant to this gathering she talked about a form of synchronicity that she called the, the social function of the self she thought that each person gathers around him or herself a kind of soul family a group of people not create not uh, gathered around us by accident but through a deeper more essential spiritual interest or a kind of uh, the need for individuation that we're all helping each other with what she called reciprocal individuation these are relationships that have objective meaning and she thought these are created in a mysterious way by the self in other words according to von franz we are with people and we meet people with whom we belong there really is such a thing as a soul family uh, i should just uh, say that um, jung's uh, position of, of the self as an archetypal potential has nothing to do with uh, the problem of atheism atheists deny that there's anything uh, that there is anything any such thing as a god they might i don't think it would be easy for an atheist to deny that people have these kind of experiences atheists see the religious experience as the result of our fear of death and helplessness our sense of incompleteness uh, so for atheists belief in god is a, as a placebo and that's why it's often said now that we're living in a post-christian god image but it's very hard to deny the existence of these self symbols they are empirically observable theistic philosophers are very well aware of the need to clarify their concept of god because if they can't do so it's not clear what it means to say that god exists um 
Theus usually uh, addressed the question of why we need anything more than a physicalist view of the universe by talking about the existence and the design of the universe and the emergence of life and morality. They don't believe that these things can be explained naturalistically. This is a very controversial area. But for lots of people, the traditional arguments for theism are no longer very compelling. So for a lot of people nowadays, theism is a matter of personal taste. So a lot of people nowadays say the most that can be done by traditional believers is tell your story and invite people to join in. For Jung, that problem is solved. Jung would point to the dream imagery of the self and say, look, this is a direct experience. It's much more than a story. So Jung's approach is, I think, is preferable to the notion of relationship to some kind of exterior or transcendent divinity that requires the mediation of an institution and a clergy. The presence of an innate God image of the, in the psyche means that the divine and the human are seamlessly continuous with each other, in contrast to traditional notions that humanity and divinity are radically separate. We need religion as a container for spirit, but many of us don't want religion in a traditional form, and that's why there's been such a steady decline in church attendance. There's a deep human longing for contact with the transpersonal dimension, but the need for a spiritual life can only be met by contact with the spirit. It cannot be met by being told what to believe. Jung's psychology allows us to express our personal experience of the sacred with no recourse to traditional doctrine and dogma. Jung's approach allows us to locate the divine within our own subjectivity. You know that the God image of the Bible, the traditional theistic God image, is the result of many, many layers of interpretation that developed over a couple of thousand years. Those God images in the Bible are a function of the times during which they were written. They were adjusted to the needs of particular people. Now, the mainstream religions will tell you that their scriptures are eternally and universally valid. But for a lot of people today, they are actually no longer relevant because we have an entirely different consciousness and we have entirely different needs than the people who wrote the Bible. What was important in the Levant in the fourth century is not necessarily important to us. We think differently. This is uh, in accord with the notion of divine accommodation. This is an old idea that suggests that the divine restricts its manifestations to the ways in which human beings can understand and respond. I would suggest that the advent of depth psychology has allowed us to experience the manifestations of the sacred in a new way. So Jung's approach is essentially a religious approach to the psyche. Well, I just want to make one final point, which, which is that we no longer need to rely on sacred texts. The direct experience of a dream speaks for itself. We, do, we no longer need to, to think that God saves or chooses particular people. Uh, these, are, these are ideas which are now obsolete. So Jung's approach is an alternative for people today who call themselves spiritual but not religious. Now, I want to um, just um, talk about um, a dream image which illustrates the way in which the transformation of the God image can occur when we pay attention to intrapsychic manifestations of the self. And this is the dream of a woman um, who was very, she was in her late 60s, she was very concerned about the prospect of aging. Uh, and um, she had the following numinous dream. She says, a numinous, an authoritative male voice informs me that it's going to teach me about the process of aging. And then she gets, um, she gets this um, uh, image appears to her. Okay, 
So the dream image, um, an, 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 the dream is this, an authoritative male voice informs me it's going to teach me about the process of aging. And then this illustration appears before her. And, she, and the dream voice says, this dream image represents the rejuvenated Godhead. And you see that um, the diagram consists of a squared circle um, with a dotted line connecting to her drawing of a very old man. It was her attempt to draw what she saw in the dream. And you see this connecting line is very important. At the bottom of the uh, squared circle is this crescent and there are two heads. And the voice says, this is an abstract of the Godhead. One head represents the male aspect of God and one head represents the female aspect of God. And the voice says to her, when we're born, God is old. As we grow older, God gets younger. And when we die, God is reborn. Now, this is a, was extremely challenging to her and to me, trying to help her with this dream, because uh, it was challenging because she'd grown up in a tradition which had an exclusively masculine God image. And the idea that the, the, the dream voice says to her, that, so that was novel. This was a whole new idea to her that the divine could have a feminine aspect. And the idea that the purpose of aging, as the voice said, could be the rejuvenation of God was completely mysterious to her. This is the kind of dream that's often referred to as a big dream or, or a collective dream. It's relevant to many people. It's an example of a personal revelation. I wasn't sure what was meant by the rejuvenation of God or what it could mean to say that when we're born, God is old, but God gets younger when we age and God is reborn when we die. The only way I think about this statement uh, is to see the dream as a comment about our experience of, of the self. Um, so um, early on in life, we accept the God image of the tradition in which we're raised, but which is an old image, but as we age, our God image changes. And in this way, it gets younger. I think uh, that may be what the dream is talking about. But the important point is that this is an example of what Jung called the transformation of the God image. It illustrates Jung's point in a letter that as our consciousness extends into the unconscious, we discover these not yet transformed God images. Jung's answer to Job was all about the transformation of the collective God image. Um, he felt that the canonical God image was forced to change as a result of Yahweh's rather unconscious treatment of Job. Um, as we see from this dream and from the experiences of Job, experiences of the self also will transform the individual's God image. Well, I think I'd like to stop at that point and open this up to questions and comments, if I may. Well, wonderful. I've really been looking forward to this lecture, Lionel. And I have a couple of questions. First, uh, the self, through the process of individuation, uh, would you agree, appears to be moving the individual towards psychic wholeness and well-being? Mm -hmm. Is that generally a true statement? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And also that the self, as you said, is an archetypal potential which suggests that choice is involved or a dialogue between the individual and the self. And so, again, I know you've discounted a little bit this notion of free will, but it seems to me that choice is a part of the individuation process. Is that, is that basically true too? Well, it depends how much free will you think we have. I mean, right. for example, um, we have powerful complexes in the unconscious. Right. Which, which affect behavior in ways that we can't control. Right. So because of complexes, free will is limited. Right. You have choice in the sense of what the Jungians call the ego self-axis. The ego can pay attention to dreams. The, right. the self is the maker of dreams. So if you choose to pay attention to your dreams and pay attention to the ego self-axis, then um, that's, I guess, a form of choice. Yeah, so there's a sense of limited free will, which, which sounds absolutely correct. 
And I do believe there are theologians, uh, one that I learned from Albert Knudsen, who taught at Boston University and was a professor for Martin Luther King, who suggests that the, there is an evolution of the God image in, in scripture, and that that evolution of the God concept from Yahweh on a volcanic mountain mm -hmm. to second Isaiah, where you have a more universal sense of the divine, yeah. suggests an evolution of consciousness in, in not only the individuals, but also the collective. And right. so there may be a place at the river for theologians and depth psychologists to gather and talk about these things. But do you really think the Christian God image or the Jewish God image is evolving? I mean, do you, do you think it, they've gotten past the biblical descriptions? It, it, it depends on which, I think, Christian or, or Jewish uh, rabbi or imam you talk to. If you're talking to Rumi or you're talking to Meister Eckhart, who was a theologian and a mystic, they would totally agree with you on that it's a function of personal spiritual experience. And as you know, Meister Eckhart's images of God are way out there in terms of traditional doctrinal belief. Yeah, but he got in trouble for it, didn't he? Well, that's, that's the point. And, and yeah. a good heretic always gets in trouble. Mm -hmm. So evolution strikes me, whether it's science or religion, as a process of heresy uh, uh, understanding a deeper place with respect to the human condition. So I, I, I still want to argue that I think there's a place for, because there's not one God image within Judaism or Christianity. I think the mystic tradition within both of those traditions, as well as Islam, as well as all the major world religions, suggests something much larger. Again, as you know, and we shared earlier, Meister Eckhart, God is a circle whose center is everywhere and circumference is nowhere that that is really antithetical to traditional doctrine but he defined himself as a christian so i think there's i think there are limitations to theology and jung certainly points this out but i think there's a conversation about the evolution of these images which has occurred and will continue to occur i think within uh, circles of individuals or as you said soul families within which these dialogues are permissible but don't you think the traditional god image is external in a heavenly realm well it's interesting rather than rather than in 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 the psyche it's interesting because in 1916 uh adolf von harnack who had just written a book about the internal imminence of god Mm -hmm. uh, was sort of dethroned as the liberal theologian by Karl mm -hmm. Barth, who was a neo-Orthodox. Mm -hmm. He said God is totally and wholly other. And it's at that point evangelical traditions with the advent of World War I and the Depression and World War II and the Holocaust and so many difficult historical events really became displaced, this idea of an imminent God. But people like Richard Rohr and Thomas Keating and others, I think, had suggested otherwise. And so... For me, it's always interesting to keep your eye on the horizon for those individuals who really take the best of psychology and the best of theology and try to understand where they might meet. So do you think that uh, Judeo-Christian theologians would allow the numinous experience of a UFO or, or something like that to well, be a valid God image? Richard Rohr is a good friend, and I know he would. In fact, if you read his meditations, he's absolutely on point with respect to this non-dual idea of the divine and this evolution and the way in which we create these projections. So again, I always look for where culture meets uh, personal spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. And I think what I want to do is sort of give room to that possibility that there is a place at the river for these kinds of conversations. And there are people like Richard Rohr and Thomas Keating and others, uh, Jamal Rahman, who's a wonderful Sufi up in the Northwest, who are really engaged in this kind of conversation. And, mm -hmm. and agree with you that the traditional images have really not only created limitations for the individual, but have tragic historical consequences. Oh, yeah. 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 So, so thank you. Uh, do we have any questions, Dana, that you see in the chat box? Well, yeah, you know, I was just going to say, uh, to one of the distinctions uh, that, that Campbell made is between priests and shamans. And he says, you know, priest's role is to maintain the established orthodoxy. Yeah. And shaman is somebody who develops a, a direct personal relationship with 
you know, their, their numinous experiences. And so I think that the, the problem in this case isn't necessarily Christianity. It's the, it's the function, it's the, the way that priesthood works, you know? And so, you know, I think that there are, there are probably Christian shamans that are seeking like Jesus, a personal relationship. And then there are plenty that are a priesthood and a priesthood is also going to take place in academia. You know, academia functions like a priesthood with its own orthodoxies and its own perpetuations. Um, so there are a couple things that I wanted to bring up, but I want to pause there and just see what you guys thought about, you know, that distinction. And, and Jeff Kripal makes the same point that we have a tendency to take personal experience off the table because we're ruled by orthodox driven priesthoods. Yeah, well, again, I think Campbell had some experiences with Catholicism, which really created a wedge for him. But again, uh, Richard Rohr is a Franciscan monk. Thomas Keating was, uh, was a Trappist monk. So I, I'm, I'm not sure the language necessarily always works. Because maybe some of the priests have the most personal experiences. Yeah. Well, so, sometimes, but I would agree with you, the tendency is that priests are oftentimes administrators and don't really allow themselves the opportunity to get involved with their own dream life or with the self or with what's going on inside of themselves. We've observed that with the, the issues of pedophilia within the Catholic Church where self-deception has been a huge issue. And it does seem that there, from the very beginnings of organized religion, that there has been a, a political aspect to the practice of religion and that those within the whatever the the sect is may or may not have an individualized religion uh religious or spiritual experience with the numinous but they are always mediated by this overbearing concern for the organization type of priesthood and i i think that as we've moved forward in time that has become less apologetic. And the priests have, have, whether it's priests or whoever they happen to be, the administrators of the religion have taken on a, a, a supported role. I mean, people have abdicated that responsibility to those people. Yeah, well, I, I, Richard Rohr would say the problem really began with Constantine when the church allied itself with the power of Rome. Mm -hmm and became a power structure. And if you look at the life of Augustine, there's a very good example of somebody early on, Lionel, and I know you're familiar with his confessions, who had deep numinous experiences, but then as a, an Episcopal bishop, or as a Catholic bishop, uh, really allowed the power structures to influence his thinking. Yeah. Well, the, the, the church has often allied with power structures politically yeah. throughout history, ever since Constantine. Yeah. Just like humans. <laughs> well, they're they human, the, yeah, yeah. They say the separation of culture and religion is kind of a later contrived development of religion, right? And so the question is, if the spirituality drops out of the bottom of these religions, does it allow them to become increasingly culture-focused as it has in Ju secular Judaism across the world, right? Like 80% of, of self-identifying Jews identify as secular. I don't know, 80%, I pulled that number out, but it's very large. So the question is, and what you see with, uh, you know, some certain Christians right now is, is it seems more cultural and more familial than it seems religious. So I wonder if when you take that spirituality out of the bottom of religion, if you open the door for more of a cultural uh, family orientation. For sure. And it's a very interesting phenomena that really the great Buddhist teachers of the current generation are Jewish. And wow. So, yeah. so the cultural pushback, you know, traditional, as you say, Lionel, traditional Judaism and the God images associated with that, and how do you reconcile that with Holocaust, you know, really drove a lot of these individuals to find that numinous experience and meditation and Buddhism and, and uh, you know, insight meditation, all of these things allowed, if you will, a doorway or a window through to the numinous. Well, my mythic imagery, uh, <laughs> may no longer be relevant. I mean, do you, you know, uh, the, the, the Hebrew Bible consists largely of mythic imagery. Yeah. Mount Sinai, the Exodus, these things didn't actually happen. Yeah, yeah. In, historically, they are important mythic images. They have symbolic meaning, but they're not history. 
Well, and that's the problem, I think, with much of Christianity and Judaism at this point is they have not evolved past the literalism of their yeah, text. Exactly. And because they don't understand, as Campbell pointed out so clearly, that all religious language is symbolic, is metaphor. Yeah, didn't Campbell say that uh, religion is misunderstood mythology? Uh, I think. Exactly. Yeah. I, I yeah. think I, I, and I wanted to bring, I, I only pause at that because I think that there's, I think that's true for most cases, but I also think that there, it's possible for a Christian that recognizes the symbolism to go full circle where they see that, oh, there's something important about the ability of the meaningfully symbolic manifesting in the literally real. And it just changes the direction. But that changes where you see Jesus isn't a reduction to literal, you know, something. And it becomes a, a manifest, you get it, yeah. Uh, and so I think that that's one of the things that Christianity especially calls for because of its emphasis on literal history. Uh, and I think that it drives us to, it encourages us to make more symbolic and meaning, more meaningful symbolic sense of our literal experience. Yeah, I absolutely will. And I do think there are pioneers that are moving forward on the front, Lionel, that you're speaking to, that personal religious experience is the foundation of everything else. And out of that comes our morality, out of that comes our politics. But without that, we have really a lot of confusion, as we observe. Okay, so what about the historical and archeological validation of these symbols and myths? There is no archeological evidence for most of the biblical stories. There's no archeological evidence for the existence of Solomon. There's one stone that might refer to King David, but that's all. Um, there's no evidence that the exodus or the invasion of Canaan happened archeologically, according to Finkelstein's book about the, you know, unless they've unearthed something recently. But most of these things, there's no archeological evidence for. And they're looking hard for it. <laughs> and they've been looking for a long time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what could mitigate the symbolic power. Of no, it has symbolic power. Yeah, it has, it's mythic imagery. It has symbolic meaning, psychological meaning. It's just not history. Well, the, the, I, I, I hesitate with saying it's not history. I think it's not historical, but I would say, for example, you know, the Exodus might be a, a truncated symbolic, miniature of the real history right so like we found that there are slave uprisings all over the world at that time yeah. and that there were kinds of exit high <laughs> you know from big civilizations in the you know after the you know sea people raids and all that stuff when when all this went down so what i don't know is that exodus isn't a symbolic expression of his like like the trojan war i don't think the trojan war happened like that but it might be a symbolic miniature Oh, it might be. It might be. But you can't take it as history. The Bible says that 600,000 people left Egypt. Mm, right. So, okay. Can you imagine? Uh, and then you have all the animals and the children. And the, Imagine uh, all these people wandering around the Sinai Desert. I mean, it's just yeah, <laughs> taking this as history. I agree with you. Some, you know, some bunch of slaves probably escaped. But, I mean... It, <laughs> it just can't be taken as, but that doesn't mean that it doesn't have symbolic meaning in terms of mm -hmm. being free and all that, you know, that people attribute to it. Well, but it's not the dream. The dream, um, the metaphor is the leaven, and that's what you have to pay attention to. Yeah, it's the metaphor, it's the symbolic meaning. I agree with that, but not literal history, for God's sake. <laughs> or not for God's sake. <laughs> Why don't we go to the gallery for a second, and uh, we have Sheila, who has a question prepared for Lionel and the panel, and perhaps she would say something for us. You had mentioned uh, Freiburg, or Freibauer, or I can't remember who it was because I don't know the name. Feuerbach. 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 Yeah, Feuerbach. Yeah. Uh, as um, Jung rejected rejected him, I'm trying to place the concept of the person, of the God getting younger, springboarding off of that woman's dream, as perhaps a concept of what's called in Taoism the immortal fetus. Could those things be correlated, do you believe? Well, well I, 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 I didn't say that Jung rejected Feuerbach, did oh, I? Thank I don't you. think right. I said that. Okay. I was just using Feuerbach, who was a sort of precursor to Freud, um, 
to talk about the problem of anthropomorphizing God images, that's all. Mm. Um, and then what did you say about the immortal fetus? I'm sorry, I didn't quite catch it. In the dream of the yeah. woman who yeah. is trying to understand how God can become younger as oh, yeah. we yeah. get older, yeah. I think that for me c correlates to the concept of the immortal fetus in Taoism or what they call the spirit embryo. Oh, well, I'm not familiar with that. I'm sorry. Can anyone help me with that? I, I... Yeah, well, you know, um, Lao Tzu is really trying to suggest that the Tao in some fashion is ageless. And Lao Tzu means the old boy, right? So even though he was perhaps 80 some years old when he wrote the Tao Te Ching, he was a youth in his spirit, suggesting, if you will, the influence of that imminent presence of the Tao. So you have, I think, this appreciation that whatever this self is, it transcends the, the categories of old age or youth or young age. Mm. Okay, well, you know, that's very interesting. I, I, will, I will look it up and maybe that will help to amplify the dream. Thank you. Good question. Yeah, thank you. Okay, anything else uh, out there? I see Sunil has something. Can history be considered as not one historical storyline, but a pattern of stories seen in the past woven into one storyline? Okay, I'm gonna let you unpack that, Will. <laughs> oh, oh, I don't know, but if we, but it might help to pull up another 19th century German philosopher and, and Hegel, of course, who, wants to see history in a narrative way and, and in some ways helps us to start making sense of history in a, in a narrative way and Eliad picks up on that and he goes back to saying that you know it, it, it was the Jews that were the first real breakthrough group to put myth in history and I think that you know I don't know if I can really answer Sunil's question but but I, I do think that there is some uh, it's not until you explain history as a story narrative that you end up with that meaning and you end up with the synchronicities and you end up with the divine uh, experience of history but hopefully i've just said enough to to set up lionel to say something more more profound on that no i, I don't know enough about uh, history to be able to comment on that i'm afraid um i'm not sure what is meant by a pattern of history i, I didn't quite understand what a pattern of stories um Oh, do you, do you, does, do you mean that uh, many stories, um, like, like the Bible as a, as a story consists of many, many stories sewn together? Is that, was that what is meant? That was my first read of it. You know, the story of the Exodus is a post-exilic story that was inserted <laughs> retrospectively by um, Yahwistic monotheistic worshippers of Yahweh. When they were being exiled from after, Israel. After the exile, yeah. Right. To, to, so they're sort of projecting one to the other. And it's to also re, down to the rewrite year. the history of, of, of the people. Yeah. And good evening, Sunil, because it's nighttime Hi. in India. <laughs> Hi, uh, good morning everyone on, on that side. Uh, so uh, when I asked about history, so I, I, I had in my mind uh, the one of the greatest epics in Indian mythology, that is Mahabharat. And Mahabharat is considered as history in a way that this is exactly what had happened. So uh, uh, the question which I wanted to ask was that perhaps uh, history can be one uh, storyline as we see it, or otherwise it can be the things that had happened in past, but woven into a storyline. I hope I'm clear with my question now. Yeah, it's a good question, Sunil. And if you take again, Will alluded to the Trojan War. You know, I think what we find in Scripture is uh, a lot of stories or historical moments which perhaps have been sort of amplified. I don't wanna say exaggerated, but amplified in a way to bring meaning. So as you know, within the context of the Mahabharata, you have kind of a Job story when in the Bhagavad Gita, uh, Arjuna has in chapter 11, the experience of Krishna as the divine 
beyond all categories, beyond all descriptions, but something which is truly numinous, is given a personal spiritual experience, which then forms the foundation of that whole story. Does that make sense? Yes, exactly. So uh, that's what I wanted to ask. Like when we are talking if uh, other religions or uh, are historically correct or not, perhaps is it possible that that might not have been the exact, exact historical storyline, but perhaps some of the historical experiences which are being converted into one storyline? Yeah, I believe that's true. And I believe that's also true of the Ramayana. If you look at uh, the bridge from Sri Lanka to India, it appears that there is a bridge. It appears that perhaps there may have been a battle. Uh, so you have, I think, some historical precedents. But my take on Jung and on depth psychology is that's almost not necessary to appreciate. Um, in fact, what's important is to see Ravana and Kumbhakarna and Vibhishan and these demons over and against uh, Ram and Sita and the, the, the powers of good in the universe and to see this cosmic battle in play and to see how that unfolds in the life of the individual, that we have all of these demons inside of us. They're not out there, as Lionel says. And Ram and Sita, who are the divine couple, are not out there. They're in here. They may be out there, but Jung says that we don't really know. We don't have any proof. We don't have any evidence of this to prove this to us. So what's really relevant is this is a personal experience. The Ramayana is a projection of a personal experience that occurs every day inside of us. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you very much. That's thank why you. they say that myth never was, but always is. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, and as Joseph Campbell said, I think you alluded it to it earlier, uh, Lionel, you know, your religion is my myth. And my yeah, yeah. Is your yeah. Myth. yeah. <laughs> so. Well, and from the very beginning, humanity seems to have discovered the lure of the eternal and the ephemeral as being sort of in relation with one another and to make divine the eternal, the omniscient, the all everything. And it is interesting to me that they chose it not to be about existence as a whole, but about a personality that was somehow in the sky or, or somewhere in a magnificent out there. Yeah, and again, Baylor did the study, over 5,000 Christians, 74% of them believe that God is out there and he's not present. And I think this is what Jung was really sort of up against, was to say, well, actually, not true. The self is incarnate. And for us not to take that seriously is to create the kind of historical condition that we find ourselves in now. Uh, isn't that the story of Jesus? <laughs> Bring, bringing, him to, bringing it to here. Yeah. Well, at least in my lifetime, I have never seen more interest in world religions that there is a, a love of theology from across the world, as if we recognize that no matter how much I know about my own religious experience or what I was taught, there's really something exciting about these other religions who use the amplification of their own lives and their own theologies that then resonate or amplify my own. Yeah, and, Jung, and would be of, Jung would be horrified if anyone said he was doing theology. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. White tried to get him there, but it didn't quite work. Who? Uh, White. Oh, the Victor White. Yes. Yeah. And, yeah. 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 I think about Dana. <laughs> oh no. no. But the issue, Dana. The issue, Dana, is that theology again in the early 20th century, as I suggested earlier, became a study of belief and not a study of personal spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and belief is irrelevant to this topic. This is not a question of belief. And I, you know, there's not, belief is not faith. Belief becomes faith when it's motivated to actually act out of that yeah. core, out of that center. And so the distinction between belief and faith, and I always tell my students, tell me about the God you don't believe in, because I probably don't believe in that one either. Right. <laughs> 
there's so many God images and it's so confusing right now. So that's why personal spiritual experience becomes really the sine qua non of what is religion and what are we talking about when we say the word religion, right? Each one of us has a personal experience which helps to form an idea of what this might be, but it doesn't prove anything. There's, there's one other thing I wanted to throw at us, and, and you know, uh, Lionel started or gave us a lot of paradoxes, logical paradoxes, and, I, and then went into how Jungian psychology gets around a lot of these paradoxes. And one of the things I, I just wanted to point out there is that I think our relationship to logic dramatically changed in the last century, that this either or logic that, that is Western logic came from a translation of material logic two things can't be in one place, two truths can't be the same truth, right? So we translated material logic into the logic systems, and then we said, either or, that's impossible, this is a paradox. But quantum logic allows for paradoxes all day, and the unconscious can allow two things to be in one place, no problem. So I think that, you know, with the advent of quantum mechanics and depth psychology, both studying the world beneath this surface world, we started to come across a, a new relationship to logic that, that should over time transform our relationship with, with the divine. Mm -hmm. That's what Lionel was talking about when he spoke of synchronicities. There's something underneath that is transcends, if you will, traditional. And if you read the, the work of Mate Blanco, he, he talks about how the logic of the unconscious is entirely different than the logic of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And it allows for all these kinds of paradoxes. The logic that you find in the unconscious is very comparable to the logic of quantum mechanics wave-based, meaning resonance and harmony and likeness, uh, uh, superposition, meaning two things can be true at the same time, paradoxes are possible. So I, I really actually do believe that, that physics, I personally believe Einstein's who cracked it open when he cracked open the foundation of materialism and linear logic, and, and this happened in some ways concurrently with the, the rise of dream psychology, Jungian psychology, and I think they're going down really similar studies of logic uh, but one's the unconscious and one is beneath observation in, in the physical world. Well said. Yeah. But I do want to say that Jungian psychology is completely incompatible with Christianity, with Christian doctrine. Absolutely incompatible. Yeah. Just to be dogmatic. I'll give you a line. J.B. Phillips, who is one of the translators of the Bible, wrote a book, small book, but the title of the book, I think, sums it up. Your God is too small. I think it was Shakespeare who said, um, show me what you find in the Bible and I'll tell you what kind of person you are. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Your image, of, your image of God is an image of you. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. Come back for your back. All is forgiven. <laughs> well, once again, thank you everyone for joining us for the eighth talk of Dr. Lionel Corbett. A new myth of God. It certainly is a topic that we will not be able to resolve in a single session. And it runs through the entire body of the um, of the talks that we have been ha been having. So with that, I'm going to bid everyone farewell. And we'll see you next time. Thank you very much.